And it's a matter of clicking the space bar? A uh, space bar should go forward, or you can use arrow keys to go forward and back, which is what I did. Okay. All right, cool. So we've got, welcome back. <laughs> uh, I, we got the summary of where I came from and who I am and, and, and why I do. But, you know, what's the question of what is Haslametrics? Well, if you go to the website, you're going to see that that's the, the, the yearbook answer of what Haslametrics.com is, designed to offer predictive data uh, analysis based on teams' prior performances in a given NCAA season. I don't look at anything from the off season. I don't look at any, make any assumptions before the season, like Kentucky is going to be great and Chicago State is going to be terrible. On day one, I treat them all as equals. The algorithms behind the scenes field the team rankings, projected outcomes of future games, and then there's bracketology estimates as well. I'm not going to cover bracketology estimates, something people like, but I do have an algorithm that creates something called bracketology deserves. And uh, it's something that it's kind of a, a work in progress, but I'm not going to cover that today. Um, the basis for my rankings and, ra uh, r rankings and ratings are transitive comparisons. We'll talk about that in a little bit, and I'll show you an example of how that is performed. Um, the ratings are adjusted for game pace, home court advantage, meaningful game minutes, and recentness of game data. So you're going to see a few, uh, a few examples of this at some point. Um, I'm going to run through how home court advantage, meaningful minutes work. Um, We'll talk about that. Ratings and rankings are based on overall game performance, not wins and losses. That's something that people really sometimes struggle with because they say, I've, had, I've got friends out there in the, the college basketball industry and say, well, wins matter. Well, I don't look at it that way. I look at it like performance matters because what happens when you have, like, I'm going to pick, I'm a Villanova. Villanova plays Delaware State on a neutral court, and they, Villanova wins that game by one point. Is that, a, is that a good win for Villanova? No, that's a terrible performance because Delaware State was rock bottom in Division I this year. Villanova was the best team. So I look at performance. Think gray. Don't think black and white so much. And that's, that's what Haslametrics is about. Um, <laughs> Scripps and SQL Server do the work behind the curtain. I, uh, SQL Server is my back end. Scripps do all the work either inside a SQL Server or either VB or JavaScript that I have on the side. I do not use any software like R or anything like that. So, so what makes my stuff a little bit unique? Well, I've sworn off some of the popular methods you may hear. One of them is Dean, Dean Oliver's four factors of basketball success. A lot of people are familiar with these, and those are the four factors. And by using those four factors, you can create a linear equation to determine the outcome or the efficiency or basically a lot of different uh, numbers out there. I kind of swore that off. Um, my question is, for much of the year, is there enough data available to properly formulate a reliable equation that way? I thought, I, my, in my opinion, the answer is no. So I went away from that, and I said, you know what? I'm not looking to, to take the wheel that someone else created. I want to create my wheel. So what I ended up doing is I wanted to focus directly on shooting and scoring. After all, what happens at the end of the game, it's the scoreboard that matters, right? When, you know, that determines the wins or the loss. I'm looking at shooting and scoring. Specifically, how, how many opportunities teams have to shoot, how close to the basket each shot is. Are they, is this a team that shoots from underneath the basket, or is this a team that shoots a lot of three-pointers? How well do those teams shoot from those locations? There may be a team that shoots a ton of three-pointers, but isn't very good at shooting those three-pointers. And then on top of that, special situations. How often steals, off breakaway opportunities, and offensive rebounds affect the shot um, selection and success. And we'll talk about that. Now remember, we must, all we must also factor in these same uh, traits from a defensive <laughs> perspective. I'm, I'm looking at all these different offensive stats, but at the same time, on the other end of the court, I'm rating teams, teams in all these different categories defensively as well. So this is a big one. Uh, what makes Haslametrics a little bit unique? I use play-by-play -play logs, not box score data. Box score data is pretty easily accessible. You can just pull the data you want and slam it right into a database. With play-by-play -play data, it's a little bit trickier. Um, you have to parse the data. You have to grab the play-by-play -play data and then translate it into a possession-by-possession -possession basis. And so what happened is, is I, I grab those play-by-play -play logs, and I'm able to see a lot of different information in those play-by-play -play logs that you can't get in box score data. For example, you have clock times in there. That, that has some purpose um, for meaningful game minutes, and we'll talk about that. Um, the other thing is, when it comes to shots in a two-point territory, you, don't, you just don't see it a two-point shot. They say layup, they say dunk, they say jump shot, they say three-point jump shot. So we can 
really pull out a lot more interesting data from from play by play data that you can't normally get inside the box score data. And then when it, using a formula, and I talked about meaningful game minutes, using a formula to, to determine when a game is essentially over, I can truncate data that it can be would be contaminated by bench players. So great example. Look at that Villanova hypothetical matchup between Villanova, who was number one, who won the national championship, and a team like Chicago State or uh, Delaware State, who was just a miserable team. If Villanova builds a lead of 45 points with, say, 15 minutes left in the game, is Villanova's performance the rest of the way going to really be indicative of how Villanova plays? No, not really. You know why? Because at that point, Jay Wright is going to put his scrubs in, and he's going to get some guys some playing time. And I look at that and go, I'm not interested in rating Villanova when they're not playing their best basketball. So what I do is I find a point in the game using a, um, an equation that was created by Bill James, and I determine when a game is mathematically over from the play-by-play -play data. And once the game is mathematically over, I throw the rest of the data on the scrap heap. I'm not interested in it. Um, and then on to, I mentioned before the, the differentiation between mid-range two-point field goals and near-proximity two-point field goals. Um, again, I talked about layups, dunks, tips. That's what's called near proximity. And then everything else in the two-point range is called mid-range. They also reveal special scoring scenarios. Clock times are in there. So if there's an offensive rebound and a quick putback inside of five seconds, I can see that. If someone gets a steal, scores very quickly inside of 10 seconds at the other, other end of the court, I can see that from the play-by-play -play data. And that's where we end up coming with this four by three matrix of solving for the where versus the how. We talked about the three-pointers. Uh, three-pointers and free throws are self-explanatory, but as I mentioned here, near proximity field goals account for shots labeled as layups, tips, or dunks typically shots that are inside of five feet. Then mid-range field goals account for all other two-point shots. I would like to get some more uh, data from the play-by-play -play logs, but unfortunately, they, at the college level, they do not say it's a nine-foot shot, it's a 17-foot shot. I don't have that information. So for the most part, anything outside of five feet is largely considered mid-range. Second chance opportunities, I talked about this would account for situations where someone grabs an offensive board and there's a shot within five seconds right after that offensive board. That's a putback opportunity. And then there's breakaway opportunities. That accounts for shots 10 seconds or less after a steal. These are special situations. And the reason I picked these two, second chance and breakaway, is because those yield a higher success rate. Those are situations where you'd expect teams to score very easily and have a higher success rate. Everything else falls under set defense. There is one I'd like to add if the data was better, and it would actually be one that would work against the offense. And, and I don't know if anyone would want to guess it, but the answer is shots that come in the last three seconds of the shot clock. Because you know what happens, these teams hold onto the ball in their offensive possession, pass it around, and eventually they have to get a shot off as the shot clock gets down to two or one, and then it's not a great shot. But at this point in the, in the game, I do not have enough data to go that route. So we talked about transitive comparison. Badgers, opening night, played South Carolina State at the Cole Center. Badgers won 85-50. And we're just going to grab adjusted offensive efficiency from that game. These are the values. Now, what can we extrapolate <laughs> from this game? In my opinion, not a lot. Because you're, you're, if you want to rate Wisconsin's offense against South Carolina State's offense, it's hard to do because you're not dealing with a constant. Wisconsin's offense is playing South Carolina State's defense. South Carolina State's offense is playing Wisconsin's defense. These are apples and oranges. We don't have a constant that we can use in this situation. But the good news is, teams play again, and all of a sudden, ha, ah, two days later, South Carolina, State, <coughs> South Carolina State travels east to play Boston College. So we look at this situation, Boston College wins that game 91-52. You have offensive efficiencies, and now all of a sudden, you do have apples to apples. Wisconsin played South Carolina State's defense. Boston College played South Carolina State's defense. We can look at the transitive comparison between the, these two and come to a one set of conclusions, one piece of data that we're going to plug into our final model. Likewise, this is South Carolina State's offense right here and here. That's a constant. So we can rate Boston College's defense against Wisconsin's defense. And in this situation, Boston College came out ahead over Wisconsin in both of those. But again, it's only one piece of data. At the end of the year, there's going to be thousands of pieces of data and um, at the end of the year, Wisconsin was ranked higher than, than Boston College in my rankings. So 
You never know what you're going to get over time. So what happens is these sets of new transitive comparisons are used to form secondary transitive comparisons. Good example, we just formed a comparison between Wisconsin and Boston College. But what if we form somewhere else and using another team, we form another transitive comparison between Boston College and say Duke. At that point, we have formed a secondary comparison that we can compare Duke and Wisconsin and use that in our model. So that's what we do behind the scenes. And I look at this in the metaphor I like to use is transitive comparisons are like cooking ingredients. On the stove on day one, every pot is empty. You don't assume anything. You don't say, oh, Kentucky's going to be better than this team. I want the pot empty on day one. And new ingredients, these transitive comparisons, are added to each pot at the end of the conclusion of each set of games. So basically, I add the ingredients, I mix, and then the game data burns off at a rate of 1.5% because I want recentness of data to, to have a higher weighting. So you just do that and repeat. Every day you add ingredients, you mix it, you, a portion of it burns off, and then you repeat the next day. And that's how you get your transitive comparisons. The last thing I want to mention, I do not look at D2 games. These are only D1 versus D1 games. Those are the only things I consider. And these are the master ratings for offensive and, uh, offense and defense. I'm not going to cover these. You guys can look at my website at haslometrics.com. And we look at the different things. We look at free throw attempt rate, free throw percentage, um, attempt rate from three-point land, attempt rate from uh, mid-range, attempt rate from near proximity. You can find a lot of this information. Potential, these are the steals. Uh, <coughs> these relate to second chance points off offensive rebounds. And then these three right here, you can really find out, hey, is this a team that shoots a lot of three-pointers, or is this a team that shoots a lot of shots inside of five feet? Really break things down that way. I want to mention that the master ratings that you see on my site ref reflect predicted performance, pr predicted performance against what I consider to be the AO, which means average opponent. That average opponent is a fictitious opponent. It's not real, but it represents the average in every one of our statistical categories. So if you took all of our statistical categories and took this mythical team and said they are exactly average in every category that I monitor, all my ratings show how that all those teams would perform against that fictitious opponent, the AO. So, how are we going to predict future outcomes? Well, we have our master ratings. We have the D1 average for all the all of our metrics. Um, at this point, it's just a matter of forecasting a, a game outcome by summing the offensive and devi defensive deviations from the D1 average on top of the D1 average itself. So, this is maybe a little complicated, but if we're looking at free throw attempt rate. This would be the average in Division I free throw attempt rate. If we were looking at, say, say this was Wisconsin, was Team 1, and they were playing Duke, Team 2. If we wanted to figure out how Wisconsin would perform in free throw attempt rate um, against Duke, you would take the Division I average, you would take Wisconsin's offensive free throw attempt ra uh, rate rating minus the average, and then you'd add Duke's defensive free throw attempt rate rating uh, minus the average. That's how we determine the predicted outcome in any particular category. And we said there are certain adjustments that come into play. In this, in this case, home court advantage. Um, um, we, we bring that into, into play as well. We, we make some shifts, some subtle shifts based on uh, home court or neutral court, wherever they are. And then we assume, and this is not always true, this is the limitation of the analytics, that the teams play at full strength for the entire 40 minutes. So the, the scores that you're going to see might not be the case, especially in a case like where Villanova would play, like a Chicago State, because it's going to assume Villanova's going to go full bore all the way. And that may not be the case. So when you bring everything together, the algorithms can estimate the final score for any one of the 61,425 possible matchups in D1 college basketball. That number is actually going up next year because we're going from 351 teams to 353. And then coming across those, we can say who's going to win every single game or who's favored to win every single game. This creates what's called an all-play percentage. Tells you how many games they should win against every possible opponent. And the all-play percentage measures how many D1 opponents each team should beat on, any, on a neutral court. And that's how you see When you go to Haslametrics.com, you see Villanova number one. The reason why they're number one is they have the best all-play percentage. All-play percentage dictates um, what shows up in the order of the teams um, ranked from 1 to 351. I'm just going to touch on these really quick. These are supplemental ratings that are available at my site. Um, you can see how T, the breakdown, how they perform 
against teams rated in different buckets. Um, you have the pace in here. A, a couple of these I want to touch on real quick that I really like that a lot of people seem to like is momentum and consistency. Uh, momentum, I, I, put a, I put a game score rating on every single game, a plus or a minus rating, how they were supposed to perform and then how they did perform. What momentum does is it takes the average of every single game they played during the year and then they compare it against the last eight games. And that determines, you compare those two, you get momentum. Um, consistency looks at a st <coughs> the standard deviation of predicted efficiency. So you may have a team that's rated quite high, but if they're erratic, they're not trustworthy. So consistency measures that. And then there's a few other things. Re record quality is a, is a metric that I created to kind of look at their record, who they played, and try to judge how, how good of a team they are. We talk about um, the, the RPI that people talk about, strength of schedule, average season rating, and of course, excuse me, of course, all play percentage, which is uh, the team's estimated win percentage versus every team based on this season's performances. So, if you go to our website, that's what you would have seen at the end of the 2017-18 season. Villanova was number one, and they were number one by a, a good margin. Now, the difference between one and two in their all play percentage. Um, wasn't all that big, but that's just saying you're, you're not talking about the, um, the the margins of victory. All we're talking is that theoretically, if Villanova played 350 opponents, they should win all of them. They would be favored to win every single game on, on a neutral court. Now, would they? No. Great example. Look who look who uh, third is. You guys, remember Virginia? <laughs> Virginia was 31 and two during the regular season. They went on 17-1 uh, and one in the ACC, but then they got knocked out in the first round by a 16 seed, UMBC. Now, again, I always say on, on Twitter, you'll always hear me, hear me say Tebow. And I'm not talking Tim Tebow. I'm not getting on a knee and praying. I'm saying the entire body of work. And so that's why you see Virginia up there. People can say, well, Virginia lost to UMBC. They should be way lower. And what a horrible loss. But you've got to take into account, they went 17-1 and one in the ACC they were still considered at the end of the year to be the third best team in the country. All play estimates. This is just kind of a, a quick glance at what you're going to see. You can simulate the outcome of any particular game on any court. So this was Villanova. That's how Villanova is supposed to perform against every single team in Division I. Another thing I, uh, I put a lot of time in is the team capsules. Remember I talked about USA Today. I used to love the USA Today and the, and the team capsules that were in there. Well, I kind of wanted something that would, you know, relate a little bit better to the layperson. Whereas you have my numbers here, some people are scared by numbers, and that doesn't mean a lot to them. So what I did was I coded this stuff right here and this stuff, these curious trends in this analysis, that gives you a written, on the fly, gives you a written summary of each team. using So it automatically populates itself every day. On top of that, you can see the best performances and the worst performances for Wisconsin this past year. And then you can see the Haslametrics ranking by day to see where they were, how they fell, and if they, they climbed back a little bit near the end of the year. But this whole page right here is meant to kind of just give everybody just kind of a, a big summary of what to expect when you play Wisconsin. Now, the, the thing is, and this is the reason I do this, all this is analytics are only successful if you can successfully translate them for the consumer. If you throw a lot of data at somebody, you know, a, a good example, I talked to the director of basketball operations for the University of Nevada, and he said for every single game, I think there are people behind the scenes that handle